From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 78, recorded on August 11, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Well, I just want to say we've been doing this for a while, and I'm really happy that you're doing it with me. I'm, I'm very excited about what we're doing. I really appreciate what you do here, Vincent. You're a master science communicator, and <laughs> I really appreciate this. Thank, Thank you. you. This is the video version of Paul's column over on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we are going to discuss Paul's latest column. It's called RFK Jr.'s Plan to Eliminate Vaccines. So, Paul, let's start off by talking about uh, RFK Jr.'s worldview on vaccines and chronic diseases. What does he think about that? He thinks vaccines cause chronic diseases. He believes that, that what vaccines have done is lessen the incidence of infectious disease while at the same time dramatically increasing the incidence of chronic disease. He has said, as his quote, that essentially God has, has put him on this earth to try and eliminate chronic diseases, and that's what he wants to do. I asked God for 19 years to put me in a position where I could end the chronic disease epidemic and bring health back to our children. And the one he talks about the most is autism. He has said autism is preventable. He has said that I'm going to find the, the, the cause of autism, and then I'm going to basically eliminate it. And um, I think vaccines are that target. By September, we will know what has caused the autism epidemic, and we'll be, we'll be able to eliminate those exposures. Yeah, so you think you're going to have a pretty good idea, huh? We will know by September. Is there any scientific evidence that uh, vaccines are responsible for chronic diseases? No. I mean, while vaccines can cause serious and occasionally fatal problems, um, usually that occurs within weeks of receiving a vaccine because invariably it's based on the immune response to the vaccine. So, for example, influenza vaccine is a very rare cause of Guillain-Barre syndrome, mm -hmm. but that occurs fairly quickly. Um, the the um, vaccine Pandemrix influenza vaccine used in 2009 in Europe was a rare cause of narcolepsy which is a permanent disorder of wakefulness. But again, that all occurred within a few weeks. The oral polio vaccine was a rare cause of polio, but again, occurred within a few weeks. Same thing's true with myocarditis associated with um, the mRNA COVID vaccines or uh, clotting associated with the Johnson & Johnson adenovirus vector COVID vaccines. But these all occur within weeks. That's why, as a general rule, when you do vaccine studies, you have to wait till two months after the last dose before you close out the trial, because that will include then a, a serious uh, side effect should it occur. So RFK Jr. recently tasked the his newly appointed ACIP, the CDC Vaccine Advisory Body, to investigate aluminum adjuvants in vaccines. Tell us, uh, what what is this? So adjuvants are used in some vaccines to enhance the immune response. That allows for fewer doses or lesser quantities of the actual vaccine itself. The kinds of vaccines that generally require adjuvants are not live attenuated viral vaccines like measles vaccine, mumps vaccine, rubella vaccine, varicella, or chickenpox vaccine, rotavirus vaccine aren't adjuvanted. But for, the, for vaccine single protein vaccines, like the hepatitis B vaccine or human papillomavirus vaccine, or the, the um, conjugated polysaccharide vaccines, like the uh, Haemophilus influenza B vaccine, pneumococcus vaccine, meningococcal vaccine, those often contain an aluminum adjuvant. So when we talk about aluminum, we don't mean aluminum foil, which is what most people think about. It's a, it's a soluble salt, right? That's right. And it's the third most abundant element on the Earth's surface. So we are all exposed to aluminum all the time, assuming you live on this planet and, and eat things that grow in soil, like vegetables or drink water or anything made from water, like breast milk or infant formula. I understand that even aspirin tablets have aluminum in them. And actually a fair amount, yes. Is there any evidence that aluminum in vaccines causes harm? No, this, and I think we've discussed this before, there was a paper that came out 
with, by Anders Vid, HBID, who was a senior author in Annals of Internal Medicine, where he looked at more than 1.2 million children in this national health system, which uh, made it much easier to, to, to take that kind of look uh, during a period from 1997 to 2020, so a 23-year period, when children were receiving different amounts of aluminum adjuvants and vaccines. So he could look on a milligram for milligram level, was there anything that for those children who received more or less aluminum and vaccines that was associated with a variety of different uh, uh, possible disorders, 50 possible disorders that fell under the categories of neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, autoimmune disorders, or allergic disorders. So when you receive a vaccine that contains aluminum adjuvant, does that contribute in any way to the amount of aluminum that's already in us? No. And if you look at people and, and look at the amount of aluminum they have in their uh, bloodstream or the amount of aluminum they have in their hair, because to some extent it's stored, you can't tell that there's any difference in their vaccination histories because it's independent of your vaccination history. All right. So we'll come back to aluminum in a bit, but um, th there's an important point here in this column, and that is vaccine DPT colon vaccine roulette, a documentary released some time ago. T tell us about that and, and what effect it had on vaccine litigation. I think the birth of the modern American anti-vaccine movement occurred in April 1982 with the publication uh, on a, a major news program uh, in this program called DPT Vaccine Roulette. Um, and it was striking. It was very emotional. If you watch that film, what you saw were children who were clearly suffering. They had withered arms and legs. They were staring up vacantly at the sky. They were drooling. They were seizing. They had bicycle helmets on. They clearly were developmentally uh, delayed in a major way. And so the parents all told the same story. My child was fine. Then they got this DTP vaccine. And look at them. And that led to a flood of litigation against pharmaceutical companies. So eventually vaccine makers left the business because of this, correct? Right. By 1985, there were billions of dollars of lawsuits against these companies. And although for the most part they would win those lawsuits, it was incredibly expensive to defend them. So all there were, there were 18 companies that made vaccines in 1980. By the end of the decade, there were only four remaining. And that was because of this massive litigation. Fortunately, the Reagan administration stepped in in 1986 and created the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, which included the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, which at least provided a, a, uh, a, a way to at least stop the bleeding. You could still be obviously compensated if you had a uh, problem associated with a vaccine, but you had to go through this, these special masters who would then hear evidence on one side or the other and make a decision about whether they thought that that association with the vaccine was causal or coincidental. And it was, uh, the program is, is, isn't perfect. I think it certainly can be improved, especially by getting more special masters, which would move this along more quickly. But um, it certainly did stop the bleeding. And I think that's where RFK Jr. is heading next. We should point out that Ronald Reagan was a Republican and he was admired by many Republicans who are currently in control and are behind the uh, trashing of science and public health in the U.S. Right. Back in the days when we had a Republican Party. Yes, that's right. My parents were Republicans. <laughs> they admired Ronald Reagan. I'm not sure they'd feel the same way about the Republican Party today. Was there any evidence that in these children that you mentioned shown in this documentary, was there any evidence that the DPT vaccine was at fault? Not at all. Although I think we learned a lesson there because we were very slow to do the kinds of epidemiological studies to answer that question. I Meaning looking at children who did or didn't get vaccines retrospectively to, to say, were you at greater risk of getting these neurodevelopmental problems if you'd received the DTP, what was then the DTP vaccine as compared to not? Um, they were done by people like Marie Griffin and others, but it took a while because we were so surprised. We couldn't believe that people would think that mm -hmm. vaccines were doing this. And so we were slow to do them. Uh, but this, this studies were all very clear and consistent, which is that you were at no greater risk of having neurodevelopmental delays, any sort of long-term problems if you'd gotten that vaccine or not. And then Sam Berkovic, an Australian researcher, came back 25 years later and looked at some of these children and realized that many had a sodium channel transport defect in their neuronal cells, a so-called SCN1A mutation, which obviously you were born with. So, so although they kept calling it pertussis vaccine encephalopathy, I think what we've learned in the long run is that there's no such thing. So 
it was simply coincidence that the children got a vaccine and then started showing signs of this encephalopathy. And that's the problem with vaccines. I mean, they're given to virtually all children and they're designed to prevent vaccine preventable diseases. They're not designed to prevent everything else that happens in life. And therefore, there's always going to be these temporal associations, which aren't causal, but nonetheless are very emotional. And it's very easy to understand how a parent could could say that. Look, my child was fine. They got this vaccine. Now they're not fine. That is a perfectly reasonable question. The good news is it's an answerable question. You can answer that question in a scientific venue. And I think that question has been answered, but there will always be some people who will never believe it. So unfortunately, the These results came too late, 25 years later. And anyway, they were probably ignored, which, you know, positive results are always ignored, right, in science. Yes. No, it is interesting. I I actually talked to Sam Berkovic on the phone a a while ago, around the time he was publishing those data. It was a a fabulous finding, really interesting finding, because he was willing to go back and look at those children now much later, Mm. see that they had this problem. So during uh, the hear- the confirmation hearings of RFK Jr., Senator Warren asked him if he would not take a financial stake in these vaccine injury compensation program uh, lawsuits. And he said, no. Correct? Right. He said he is not going to give up suing pharmaceutical companies. I am not going to agree to not sue drug companies or anybody. And this is... If you, if you want to destroy vaccines in this country, it's not that hard. Just do what RFK Jr. is about to do, which is he can manipulate the vaccine injury compensation program, which is basically what Elizabeth Warren warned about when she uh, asked mm-hmm. the questions during that second confirmation hearing. You can make it so that you add something to the list of compensable injuries, like autism or eczema or asthma or whatever, or you could take certain vaccines away from that compensation program and just subject them to the slings and arrows of direct litigation in civil mm. court. You could remove vaccines from special compensation programs, which would open up manufacturers to mass torts. That will end vaccine maker, ma- manufacturing in this country. And I just feel like people don't realize how we are right on the edge of a cliff. This scares me more than anything else Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has done. What he is about to do is he is about to hold up some bogus paper, some methodologically flawed, poor paper, which is is just uninterpretable, and say, see, here it is, a landmark study, a gold gold standard study that vaccines cause, let's say, autism. And then he's going to mess around with the vaccine injury compensation program, benefiting his personal injury lawyer friends, benefiting himself, and doing nothing to help children with, say, autism in this country, other than making all children more susceptible to vaccines preventable disease. I don't think people realize this is a small market product. These companies are perfectly willing to leave this 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 industry. They are. That's what I learned from watching this up close in the 1980s. These companies were perfectly willing to give up vaccines because they're something you give once or a few times in a lifetime, not something you're giving every day. So they're never going to be blockbuster products. It's really astounding to me that he could say no to Elizabeth Warning and still get confirmed in any other time, that would be it, right? You mean in a world dominated by logic and reason, that world? Yeah, yes, right. Because we're not in that world anymore, as you've said many times, right? It's just outlandish. So you think he's going to manufacture a bogus study showing aluminum causes autism. Um, And and one of the things you say is that he will say that uh, studies exonerating aluminum have been manipulated or influenced by big pharma. Of course, that's what He always says, but the Danish study that you just talked about, that's just taking old data and looking at it. How could that be manipulated? Right. And the the institute where uh, Anders Vid works and his co-workers work are not, do not receive money from pharmaceutical because they're not in the pocket of big pharma. But see, he's like a one-trick pony, RFK Jr. The minute you hold up a data showing, look, look, MMR vaccine doesn't cause autism. You can do that 24 times. And he'll still say the same thing. The government's in the pocket of the pharmaceutical industry. The, The researchers are in the pocket of the pharmaceutical industry. The journals are in the pocket of the pharmaceutical industry. The only person apparently who's clean as him. So we should only believe him. This is basically his point of view. It's interesting because he's not a scientist, right? He's, he's a lawyer, he's a politician, but he's not a scientist. And I don't understand why he's listened to at all, in fact, when it comes down to scientific issues. 
Me either. And in fact, at one, one hearing, one committee hearing, he said, you know, you shouldn't listen to me yeah. on issues of uh, health or medicine because, uh, you know, I'm not a doctor. So yeah. like, don't listen to me. That was the one thing he said that I actually completely agreed with. I just wish he agreed with it. But I don't think people should be taking advice, medical advice right. from me. So last week, as you know, uh, he announced that uh, he is cutting contracts for mRNA vaccines, which is a topic we'll talk about uh, next week. But he said he believes Americans should have the vaccines that they want, and he's going to make sure we make ones that are better than the mRNA vaccines. So does he really think Americans should have the vaccines that they want? Well, that's what he said. He said, I will, I will never take away your vaccines. I'm not going to take away anybody's vaccines. I, I've never been an anti-vaccine. Right. If you want them, you can get them. Then he proceeded to do exactly the opposite of that. When he stood up in that one minute video with Marty McCarry, the commissioner of the FDA on his right, and Jay Bhattacharya, the head of NIH on his left, and said that we are no, we, Health and Human Services, are no longer going to recommend the, the COVID vaccines for pregnant women. That made it very difficult for pregnant women to get that vaccine. So he did take away that vaccine from pregnant women. And thus, we became the only country in this world that didn't consider pregnancy to be a high risk uh, 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 issue for, uh, for COVID. I couldn't be more pleased to announce that as of today, the COVID vaccine for healthy children and healthy pregnant women has been removed from the CDC recommended immunization schedule. So he does take away vaccines. I mean, and, and by doing uh, what they've done now uh, the, the, with the Pfizer vaccine, I don't know if you, you paid attention to this over the last couple of days, but what they did was they said now that they the, the Pfizer vaccine for young children, meaning children left from six months of age, say, to five years of age, is right now under emergency use authorization. Mm -hmm. So it's not a licensed product yet. And, and so what they said is can't use it. You can't use that vaccine. So therefore, if you're going to try and vaccinate someone less than five years of age, you have only the Moderna vaccine. And that vaccine is only licensed for high-risk children, even though half the children who are getting hospitalized are not in high-risk categories. So, so, and Moderna would have to make up for that shortfall of not having Pfizer's vaccine uh, any uh, available any longer. And so he does take away vaccines. He does because he thinks they're doing harm. So it makes sense he would want to take them away. Your last word of this column is buckle up, Paul. What do you mean by that? What I mean is I think we are on the verge of something disastrous. I, I think that if he can successfully manipulate the vaccine injury compensation program to make it onerous for these companies to make vaccines, they'll stop making it. And then we are going to be in, in the same spot we were in 1986 before the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, when the only company that, that made the pertussis vaccine at that time was Letterly Laboratories, and they said, we're out. We're not making pertussis vaccine. So there would be no pertussis vaccine for this country, which means we could go back to a time when 8,000 children died every year from pertussis. And I feel like this is where we are. And he would believe he's doing good. He would believe that by eliminating vaccines, he is doing good. He is that far gone on this issue. We'll put a link to this column in the show notes, and you should go take a look and, and read it. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.